Today, I'd like to share my story of gratitude, resilience, and self-belief. As part of this story, I'd like to pay special tribute to my mum. And as much as I'd only like to talk to you about all of this great stuff, to do so, I have to talk to you about some not so great stuff. At the age of 20, I was diagnosed with lung cancer and told I could never be cured. My name is Lachlan Mullen. I'm a 26-year-old university student and I'm studying to be a naturopath. I'd now, like to, I'd now like to begin by telling you about my life before cancer, my diagnosis of cancer and my journey through treatment. Okay. In 2012, I was a carefree 20 year old who loved life and thought I was invincible. I just began a new career as an electrical apprentice. I'd spend all week working, go to the gym every day after work, and spend the weekends out partying with my mates. In the first year of my apprenticeship, I developed a persistent cough. I went to the doctor who told me, give it time, it will pass. I returned several times over the next few months. Until, until I was eventually sent to see a specialist who thought my sinuses were causing the cough and had a surgery to clear them out. A few more months had passed and things began to get dramatically worse. In the mornings, I'd throw out my breakfast, followed by coughing up blood. I'd then continue my usual regime of a full day's work, followed by the gym. But mum was beginning to get overly concerned and rightfully so, she demanded I went back to the doctor but this time she came with me. She insisted that more needed to be done. And finally, after almost a year, I sent for a chest X-ray later that week. The X-ray showed unusual results. So they asked me to stay back for a CT scan as it gave a more detailed picture. Shortly after, I was called into the doctor's office. By now, I was beginning to feel concerned. The doctor explained to me that the scan showed a very large tumour in my right lung and that I needed to go to the Royal Adelaide Hospital immediately. I can't remember my exact emotions at this point. I just remember walking back to my car in absolute shock. I sat in my car for a few minutes as the shock came into fear. I was, I was so overwhelmed. I thought, I must have cancer. I didn't know anything about cancer. I just associated it with death. I began to drive home and I had a million thoughts going through my mind as I was trying to contemplate how I was going to tell mum. I arrived home to an empty house and I sat on my bed in fear, anticipating mum's arrival home any minute. Shortly after mum came home, she came into my room. She could tell something was wrong. And as I tried to say, mum, you need to take me straight to hospital. I have a tumour in my lung. I just broke down into tears. I was so scared. Mum rushed me to emergency, where I was admitted immediately. The doctors briefed me on all the different cancers I may have and all the different investigations they were going to do. But they assured me that I couldn't have lung cancer because I was far too young. Over the coming days, I began to come to terms with the situation and mentally prepare myself for the challenges ahead. I only thought of the positives Things like I'm young, I'm strong, I have the support of my family and friends. I live in a country with one of the best health systems in the world. But one of the positives I thought of was, at least I won't have lung cancer, because I associated that with a very grim survival rate. That Monday, I was once again called into the doctor's office, where the cardiac team sat around my mum, dad and I, and gave me the worst a most unexpected diagnosis I could have heard. I was diagnosed with extensive stage four lung cancer. The cancer had spread from my lung into my bones, abdomen, limbs, and the worst part, throughout my brain. I was told I could never be cured. The best hope was to prolong my survival. Once again, I was in shock, fear, and disbelief. Telling my friends was the hardest part. But after a few days, I made a very important decision. I said to myself, you can sit around all day feeling sorry for yourself, and tomorrow you'll wake up and the cancer will still be there. 
or you can just get on with it and do everything you can to beat it. And from there, I started looking at all of the positives again, except this time I changed the belief that at least I won't have lung cancer with the new one. If they've never seen someone so young with lung cancer before, they have no grounds to tell me that I can't beat it. Over the next 18 months, I underwent a series of invasive treatments. The first of which were chemotherapy and full brain radiation. However, I wasn't just relying on these as they'd already told me that they couldn't cure me. So I saw a naturopath and drastically changed my diet and lifestyle. These changes were incredibly challenging during chemo, as my body was so weak and lethargic and they required so much commitment and resilience. I was trying to maintain a social life and whatever exercise I could manage, but the gradual cycles of chemo were beginning to take their toll. In the third cycle, they doubled the dose and it was too much. All my hair had fallen out, I'd lost 25 kilos and I ended up in hospital. I just couldn't get out of bed. I'd become so weak that I had to sit on a chair in order to have a shower. This is where it really hit home to me how much it was affecting my body. A decision was made to take me off chemo, leaving me without treatment. Oops. Meanwhile, a test had just come back positive for a specific gene mutation. For a specific gene mutation that only 4% of lung cancer patients have. There's a new experimental drug being trialled, but I was ineligible for the trial. However, the drug company were going to allow me to receive a new drug on compassionate grounds. But there was a catch. My brain cancer needed to be controlled. My oncologist explained to me that I need to have a tumour rem removed from the front of my brain and that the surgery was booked in for 9am the next morning. Rather than being worried or scared about the surgery, once again I thought about the positives. The sooner I had this surgery, the sooner I could receive this new treatment and start getting better. While recovering in hospital from the surgery, I became feverish and had difficulty breathing. Sorry, while, while recovering at home from the surgery, I became feverish and had difficulty breathing. As a white rush to emergency, the cancer had caused excess fluid buildup in the sac surrounding my heart, causing heart failure. I nearly died. I underwent an emergency procedure to have the fluid removed from around my heart. While recovering in hospital, I received a new treatment from overseas, and it was just a tablet I took twice a day. I began to get better. Mum had bought me a small rebounder trampoline, which I could bounce on every day until I was strong enough to run on the streets again. This was my goal. After a couple of months, I received my first scan results since being on a new treatment, and they showed a significant reduction in the cancer. I was feeling better, I was getting stronger, and I was motivated. I thought this would be a great opportunity to, to attempt one of my goals. <laughs> so I, I attempted to go for a run. I managed 800 metres. It was slow, painful, and I was exhausted, but it was a huge step forward. From here on, my running continued, and so did my good results in the treatment. Not long after, I was well enough to travel to Europe for three weeks with my older brother. Upon returning, I wanted to return to work for a few days a week. My boss has supported me so much in my return that I was really struggling with the workload, even on light duties. I was no longer strong enough to lift myself into a roof, and I wasn't enjoying work like I used to. However, at this point, I just discovered a new passion for natural medicine, as I believe my diet and lifestyle changes had helped me so much in my recovery and rehabilitation from all of my treatment. So I researched a degree in naturopathy and enrolled at university for the following year. I now wanted to become a naturopath so I could help others like myself change their lives. I wanted to turn the tragic event of my diagnosis into a new exciting opportunity. Things seemed to be looking up. I was feeling really positive about my future, when suddenly I was back in hospital. The cancer had progressed and I underwent 
a second heart surgery. While recovering in hospital, sorry, I had no idea what my next treatment would be. But rather than worry about that, I set myself a new goal. <clears throat> On that day in hospital, it was the city to pay. I set myself a goal I even wrote a status on Facebook saying, so I'm in hospital recovering from heart surgery. This day next year I run the city to pay. Meanwhile, mum was on the computer every night researching every clinical trial in the world related to my cancer. Not long after, I just finished a run when I fainted. After getting back to my feet, I threw up. The cancer in my brain was now active again, and I needed a new treatment as soon as possible. We said no to chemo. Mum knew there were better treatments out there. She persuaded the oncologist to treat my brain cancer while we waited for a new targeted treatment to become available. So I underwent a second brain surgery, further brain radiation, and then traveled to Sydney for a form of targeted brain radiation. This rounded off the first 12 months of treatment for me. I'd undergone chemotherapy, three loss of brain radiation, two brain surgeries, and two heart surgeries. I had even managed to travel to Europe in between. It was, sorry, at this point, Mum had just discovered that one of the worldwide clinical trials she'd been following now had a new trial site in Australia. It was Brisbane. She informed my oncologist, he referred me, and the following week I was accepted in. It was now the beginning of 2014. I began a clinical trial in four weeks and I began university in five. Mum and I realised we were going to need lots of su support for this clinical trial in Brisbane as we are going to have to travel every four weeks. So my brother's soccer club, Adelaide Olympic, held a huge fundraiser for me. The night was a massive success and the money raised allowed Mum and I to travel to Brisbane so I could take part in this clinical trial. Not long after, I began a trial on my 22nd birthday, and the following week I began university. This was an incredibly challenging time for me. Travelling regularly while trying to adapt to studying again. But I could feel I was getting better after the first week in a new trial. And I committed myself to uni. After two months in a new trial, I was feeling great and I was the strongest I've been, so it's no surprise to hear that there was a significant reduction in the cancer, not only in my lung, but my brain. From here on, the great results continued, and I was doing better at uni. It was now the second semester. <clears throat> I'd been training hard, and I knew I'd achieve my goal of running the city to Bay. However, I thought this would be a great opportunity to give something back. Red Card are a youth cancer charity to support the families of young people with cancer, and they supported my family so much over that 18 month period. So I thought this would be a great opportunity to raise money to donate back to the charity by running the city debate. Once again, the support and generosity of so many allowed me to raise $3,000 to donate back to the charity. I then completed 12 kilometers, and it's one of my proudest moments. I'm now coming to the end of my fifth year of university. And I've been on a clinical trial in Brisbane for three years, which has kept my cancer stable. Up until January last year, when unexpectedly I had a seizure at the gym. When unexpectedly I had a seizure at the gym. This was the first sign of cancer progression in my brain, and it also meant I was no longer allowed to drive my car. The clinical trial ended immediately, and I switched straight over to a new type of treatment, which had just become available. While waiting to see if this new treatment was effective, I bought a bike and began cycling everywhere. This way I could keep up with my fitness and I wouldn't miss any lectures or work. However, after four weeks, the cancer was still rapidly progressing in my brain. This couldn't have happened at the worst time, it was right in the middle of my uni semester. Then one morning at the gym, I became nauseous, began vomiting and had to be taken to emergency. I needed to undergo a third brain surgery to remove the tumour that was causing my symptoms. I knew I was going to miss several weeks of uni, so I worked on my assignments while in my hospital bed, knowing I have so much to catch up on. The surgery was very successful. However, 
I needed, I still needed a new treatment as soon as possible. There was a new clinical trial in Melbourne. However, I was ineligible for the clinical trial. The mum discovered that the drug company had a compassionate access program. And soon I was able to receive a new treatment directly from America. My girlfriend and I had missed three weeks of uni. And we only had four weeks to complete all of our assessments by the due date as we had overseas travel booked for our holidays. So you're probably wondering how we dealt with this. Well, the same way I've dealt with the last five and a half years. The same way I deal with having chronic disease on a daily basis. Rather than worry about what we couldn't control, we focused on what we could control. Nothing else could be done until I received my next scan results. So we made study our priority. We worked so hard, <coughs> late nights, early mornings, glued to our books, and it all paid off with one of the best weeks of my life. We successfully completed exams. A few days later, I received the scan results, which showed after only five weeks, this new treatment had significantly reduced the progressive cancer. And this was topped off the very next day with flights overseas. I spent a month in Italy with my girlfriend. And since returning, we've completed a further 12 months of study with less than 12 months remaining in our degree. So now you know about my life before cancer, my diagnosis of cancer, and my journey through treatment. I'd now like to pay tribute to my mum. From as early as I can remember, mum was raising my two older brothers and I as a single mum. Mum was incredible. She was raising three boys on her own while studying at uni, working part-time, and cleaning friends' houses for extra cash. She barely had enough to pay the bills, but she always made sure we had everything we needed, whether that was food on the table, that we were all doing well at school, or she somehow managed to get us to three separate soccer trainings and games every week. No matter how much she had on her plate, she always made sure we were brought up to show respect, compassion, and good manners. All of mum's hard work, resilience, and self-belief paid off when she graduated from uni and became a teacher. From here, she completed her masters and has had a successful career as an education consultant. My mum's my hero. She's the smartest person I know, and she's, she's the ultimate role model. When I was first diagnosed with cancer, Everyone was in such shock and disbelief that mum was doing her absolute best to put on a brave face and reassure me that everything would be okay. Straight after my diagnosis, she was on the computer every night researching everything she could about cancer and all the treatments that were out, that were out there all over the world. She was the one behind all of my lifestyle changes. It was just my job to put them into action. And in fact, for every change I made, she made it with me to help me along the way. When I, started, when I began chemo, she started working part-time to look after me, and she's accompanied me to every appointment I've had. Mum always has been, and still is, <clears throat> keeping up to date with every clinical trial around the world related to my cancer. And if it wasn't for this, I wouldn't have been on the clinical trial in Brisbane for three years, which saved my life, and I may not have been on the clinical trial drug which I'm taking today. So really, who knows where I'd be today. This is my tribute to my mum for her influence on me throughout my life. I'd now like to finish by talking to you about three things that I've taken from this journey. The importance of gratitude, resilience and self-belief and the roles that they play in taking control of our own lives, especially in times of adversity. I wanted to pay tribute to my mum because I believe these three things have been a big part of me from a young age due to my upbringing. But it's my battle with cancer which has really developed and brought them out of me. I believe it all begins with mindset, maintaining a positive outlook over negative in every situation, even if it's the smallest of things. If I had listened to my doctors when they told me I could never be cured, I would have believed that was my future. Every day I would have thought about how much time I had left, all the things I was going to miss out on. I would have felt sorry for myself and lost hope. 
is that I said to myself, if they've never seen a case like mine, they have no grounds to tell me that I can't beat it. And since then, I haven't just had this approach towards my diagnosis, but my whole outlook on life. I now know what I'm capable of and have the same approach of positivity and determination when facing any challenge. A positive mindset is your greatest ally when facing challenges. No matter what, no matter what stage of life you're in, it's the fact that there will be challenges. But there's a quote that I really love. When you change the way you look at things, the things you look at will change. I'll say that again. When you change the way you look at things, the things you look at will change. I stopped looking at my cancer as an illness, and I started looking at it as an opportunity. It gave me a whole new lease on life and allowed me to decide which pathway I wanted to follow in life. If you have a negative attitude towards challenges, it will have a negative effect on your mindset. If you have a positive attitude towards challenges, you won't just overcome them, but you'll benefit from them. And if you don't overcome them the first time, you continue trying. Part of maintaining a positive mindset is being thankful for what you have. Thinking about all of the positive things in your life and being grateful. I didn't complain about being, about being diagnosed with cancer because I didn't need that negativity in my life and needed the people around me. I focused on what I was grateful to have in life and used that energy towards overcoming my challenges. Setting goals was another great way for me to overcome challenges. I had so many short-term goals, so be to achieve something over a day or a week or a month. It may have just been while I was on chemo to get out of bed and go for a walk outside. But I had long-term goals to achieve something over a year or more, such as running the city today or university. The thing is, there's nothing special about me. I'm the same as anybody in this room. Anyone can achieve whatever they set their mind towards. To tell you the truth, university was initially a huge challenge for me. In high school, I was a lazy student. I used all the excuses, I don't like the classroom environment, I get distracted too easily. I never thought I had what it took to go to uni and spend so much time studying. But it's this journey that made me realise that I can achieve whatever I set my mind towards. And through hard work and dedication, I taught myself how to study. And as I became better at it, I got in a bit of enjoyment out of it and a sense of achievement. I believe in tragedy, there is opportunity. And over the past five years, I've taken every opportunity which has come my way out of this journey. The biggest of which, I'm changing my career path and following my passion for natural medicine. After almost six years, I can honestly say that being diagnosed with cancer was actually the best thing that ever happened to me. Because as hard as it's been, as much as I've had to endure, my life is now better than it ever would have been if it wasn't for this experience. Yes, at times I've really struggled, but in life, sometimes it's okay, okay to struggle. Because in a struggle, there is growth. And this journey has allowed me to grow so much as a person in such a short space of time. It has provided me with new opportunities and it has given me a whole new outlook on life. These are my ideas of gratitude, resilience and self-belief, which I've taken from my journey of living with cancer. As I touched on earlier, I wanted to share with you my diagnosis of cancer. I wanted to pay tribute to my mum. And I wanted to share with you my ideas of gratitude, resilience and self-belief. It's been a great privilege to spend time with you today. I'd once again like to thank the host for inviting me along. I'd just like to leave you with one thing. Throughout life, we all have challenges. We all, we all have problems. All of our challenges are different and vary in many ways. But if you ever find yourself stuck or struggling, try to take a step back and look at the situation from a different perspective. You may find it's not as hard as you first thought, or you may learn or develop from it, or you may even find opportunities. 
which you never knew were there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lucky. I'm not sure how I'm sum all that up, really. It's a pretty inspirational story. One thing I will say is that you're a very strong young man. And it was taken out of you to help you kind of I'd be interested to know how you're progressing with your treatment. Um, since I was on the clinical trial in Brisbane for three years and everything was just no evidence really of disease. Yep. But uh, um, I guess once it spreads, once it becomes stage four and it spreads through your body, um, even though there's no evidence, you can't, you can't really tell it may pop, out, pop up again. And yeah. uh, last year in January, we got on top of it pretty early um, because we're always keeping a very close eye and it popped up and changed treatments and the treatment changed, it didn't work. Um, so I progressed a bit more and managed to go into this um, new trial drug, which I've been on for a bit over a year. And in the clinical trial in Brisbane, it looked like I had a little bit of um, cancer in me, which um, was inactive. Now it looks like there's, there's no evidence really at the moment that I can tell is definitely inactive cancer or scar tissue. But um, my health is fantastic at the moment. So set up Got my routine scans um, tomorrow, actually. So I'm expecting in a week's time to hear the news that as it usually goes along, that everything's normal and fine. But as I said, so much of it is um, self-education and oncologists um, have so many patients that they can only spend a certain amount of time with each patient and they can only offer what they've got to offer we're having so many patients, they can't always be looking out for every other what other hospitals offer, what else is happening around the world. So it's very much self-advocation and being aware, and that's why a big part of my story is being paying tribute to my mum because yeah. she's very much aware. And the um, mutation that I have, the um, ALK mutation, there's a very strong ALK community in Australia because it tends to be Lung, lung cancer and people under 50 who are non-smokers getting lung cancer um, seem to have this mutation. So it's a good community and they all sort of keep up to date with what's happening. So um, I'm very happy where I am and um, I'm very aware of if something was to happen, what our next steps are and what's next available and that sort of thing because there's further next generation clinical trials coming out for the same sort of thing. Yeah. Sounds like your mother's a great lady. She's someone to have in your corner, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. Have anyone got any questions for them? Are you doing the next city debate? What's that? Are you doing the next city debate, the one that's coming up? Um, no, I couldn't do this one. I forgot what it was. Um, something came up, but um, <laughs> I was thinking about it at the start of the year, and then um, no, I'll probably I'll try and do the next one. So I haven't done one for a few years. So I, will, I was going to do the tour down under at the start of the year and was all ready to go with that because I got a bike last year and got overly motivated with cycling and that became a big thing and then I got cancelled to heat and so on. But I've just been spending more time on the bike rather than running so I need to get back into running to do a city show. <laughs> Not a year or so to go to your studies, are you? Um, I'll be finishing June next year. Awesome. So I'm in the student clinic now, I'm getting my impatience and that's really good. That I'll officially be a match cut next year. So it's been a long degree, yeah. which a lot of people don't realise. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> how um, serious the degree actually is these days, so I've really gone on to it. Yeah. Um, but I'll, yeah, hopefully everything goes smoothly and I won't be, none of my semesters will be interrupted with any more surgeries and I'll get it finished. Lucky wheels, one of prior to nine. I socially had a few cigarettes occasionally being the yeah. thing of being out, but I never smoked. Yeah. Um, not at all. And as I said, this so it was genetically uh, um, it's a genetic it's a genetic mutation, but it's not hereditary. Right. So I'm not sure exactly uh, so it's some sort of gene mutation, but it's not um, thankfully it's not hereditary, so I know it's not something I could pass on in the future. Right. But, um, yeah, it's very, it was only discovered about, a, the particular mutation was only discovered about 10 years ago. So I guess I was lucky in the way that it 
that I got this 20 years ago, mm -hmm. that wouldn't have been this kind of trials. So, yeah. Was there a specific um, diet that you went on? So you were saying you went off the chemo and then you got involved in like the natural Since medicine at that time? Got diagnosed, I've been um, seeing um, naturopaths as well, and I've had a very integrated approach. I've been receiving all of this treatment. At the same time, I received a lot of natural therapies, and the goal of natural therapies when you, someone does have cancer and they're getting all of the Western treatment and you're trying to give them an integrated approach is to treat the person, not cancer. So you're treating the person, so basically to make sure my immune system is functioning as well as possible, make sure my liver's um, functioning as well as possible, especially all of the treatment that you're going through and all of the detoxification that has to deal with making sure all of your health begins in your gut, in the stomach, so always making sure what I put into my um, body is the best sort of nutrition I can um, have and balancing everything else. I want to study it and hopefully um, help people in the future. So it's very much um, treating myself and letting myself be fortunate enough to have very good Western medicine in clinical trials. Treating myself so that these clinical trials can work the best they possibly can and my body is as um, receives from the best and um, recovers well and is strong enough to deal with all those treatments. And did you have a module in your naturopathy course or did you get RPL? Um, it's, yeah, it's a bit of RPL, but, um, but I guess they touch on it, but um, for, uh, I've actually had a couple of people see me, specific way of being a clinic because they know who I am and that sort of thing. And fortunately, my match part's one of my lecturers, so I've got a bunch of his sort of resources that he uses. And um, he was the lecturer of, of all of my other lecturers. He's sort of been around for about 40 years. So I think a lot of them follow his sort of way of going about things. So I was lucky enough to get my hands on his documents and go through that. But yeah, it's all about treating the, um, if someone came to me and they <clears throat> said, I don't want to do Western treatment, I want to do natural treatment, you just have to say to them, look, um, you're making this decision. It's not up to me. Um, I'm happy to treat you, but I advise that you try to go and we can work to two together to support you while getting this treatment and support you so you get the least side effects from this treatment. So a lot of the tool is reducing side effects because a lot of the Western treatment, the thing that gets people is they really struggle to handle it. And so supporting their bodies so they can handle it, so it can do its job of killing the cancer while, without damaging the body too much. So yeah, this I guess the viewpoint that people take on it. Mm. It's an amazing story. I keep hearing that my um, my sister-in-law is going through cancer at the moment, and they keep telling me 